From the election of 1860 to Fort Sumter to the Battle of Gettysburg, this is the American Civil War. Welcome to Lessons in Humanities. For the PowerPoint presentation or the Google Slides version of this presentation in this video, visit the Lesson in Humanities store. You can find the link in the description below. The Lesson in Humanities store also includes primary source activities, history helpers, timelines, and many other resources that can help teachers teach history. Let's begin. The American Civil War would be the bloodiest war in American history. 750,000 people would die. The war would touch the life of every American in one way or another. As Dr. James McPherson says, the war resolved two fundamental questions left unresolved by the American Revolution, whether the United States was to be a dissolvable confederation of sovereign states or an individual nation with a sovereign national government and whether this nation, born of a declaration that all men were created with an equal right to liberty, would continue to exist, being the largest slaveholding country in the world. So today's presentation is going to talk about some of the events that led up to the American Civil War, but it will also talk about some of the battles. And there were more than 10,000 military engagements during the Civil War. Uh, this presentation will touch on some of the, the major ones. Let's start with what uh, with the timeline. I'm sorry. So if you look at at this uh, timeline in the middle there, you'll see the Civil War, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Everything in yellow before that is some of the major events that would lead up to the Civil War. A lot of it had to do with territorial expansion, whether the new territories should involve uh, slavery or be free states. But it was Lincoln's election which would finally spark the Civil War, which will start in 1861. Of course, after the Civil War, the country, most more particularly the South, will be destroyed and need to be refixed. So that would be the Reconstruction period. But with all the events that would lead to the Civil Civil War, it would be the election of 1860 when Abraham Lincoln was elected that would be the final spark to to start the election. You see. Lincoln, he was a Republican. He's the first Republican president in American history. He wasn't the first to go for office. In 1856, there was another candidate who lost, but in 1860, he won. And part of the Republican platform was to not let slavery expand into new territories. Now, even though Lincoln was uh, on record saying he was against slavery, he did say he wasn't going to abolish slavery in the South. Now, was that because he didn't want to, or was it because he didn't want to start a civil war? Now, all the presidents before him, really, I mean, it depended on which president, because some presidents were against slavery prior to the civil war, but they didn't do anything about it because they were worried about starting a civil war. And that's exactly what's going to happen. See, the South is not going to believe that Lincoln is not going to um, abolish slavery. So this will be the final, the final event that's going to lead uh, to a, a civil war. Um, so a lot of states are going to leave the Union, and then shots will eventually be fired. But Abraham Lincoln, he won 40% of the popular vote, but he won zero electoral votes in the South. And the South was worried that he would abolish slavery, even though he said it wouldn't. But after Abraham Lincoln became the 16th president of the United States, uh, he, uh, the, it was South Carolina. They voted to succeed from the Union. So the Union w was finally was dissolved, and this was what everybody had worried about all the way from 1776. In fact, some historians believe that some of the Founding Fathers wanted to um, abolish slavery way back in the beginning of the, uh, of the nation, but they were worried about the, you know, the South not joining the Union and it would finally happen in 1861. So, like I said, it would be first South Carolina. So if you look at the map here, the, the states in red, those are the, um, that's Confederate States of America, that's the South, and the, the blue and the light blue will be, blue, be the North. 
But uh, November 6th, 1860, Lincoln wins the election. And then South Carolina immediately calls for a convention to discuss leaving the Union. And then they finally do that. They do that in uh, December 20th, 1860. And then one after another, Mississippi, then Florida, then Alabama, then Georgia, then Louisiana, then Texas, seven states will leave the Union. Now you'll notice there are some states that haven't left the Union yet. For example, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Virginia. Uh, the other states that had already succeeded wanted them to leave too, but they hadn't left at that time. They were not sure. They didn't want a war. But nonetheless, we have a new country at this time, and it's called the Confederate States of the United States, or sorry, Confederate, Confederate States of America. And uh, so it began on February 4th, 1861. Uh, they met in Mississippi, and they set up a new country. And they named Jefferson Davis as the president. He's the person in this picture. Now, before becoming president of the Confederate States of America, he was a senator, a representative, and even a secretary of war in the United States. And many historians agree that Davis was a much weaker wartime president than Abraham Lincoln would be. So the capital of the Confederate States would start in Mississippi, but it would move to Virginia because Virginia would later succeed. And it's right not too far from Washington, D.C., but nonetheless, we have a new president. We have seven states who have succeeded. And on March 4th, 1861, is Lincoln's inauguration. Now, he said he would not abolish slavery in this inauguration. And he also said in the South that the success, succession was actually legally void. He mentioned he would not invade the southern states unless the South was the aggressor. But he also said he would use force to maintain possession of federal property in the succeeded states. So some people in the South felt this was a little bit threatening. And it would only be a couple weeks later that the first fires, the first shots would be fired in uh, the American Civil War. And that's going to be at Fort Sumter. So this is the first battle and nobody died in this battle, but this is the first one. But South Carolina has seized all the federal property in Charleston in the area around that except for the Fort Sumter which was in the harbor um, and President James Buchanan uh, this was before Lincoln became was inaugurated so in the time period between Lincoln's election and his inauguration the prior president James Buchanan was in, unable to get supplies to the fort and the conditions on the fort with the Union soldiers there's about 80 of them was very poor and they needed food um, and batteries around Charleston had their guns facing right at Fort Sumter because it was a federal property with Union soldiers in what they felt was their country. So when Abraham Lincoln became president, one of his first major crises to solve was to get supplies to Fort Sumter. And it's not necessarily guns to fight. It was more like food so they could survive. And Lincoln notified the South, South Carolina governor to say that he was resupplying the fort. And in response, South Carolina government insisted that the Union soldiers leave the fort. And the, the, the general or the, the major, Major Robert Anderson, who was in Fort Sumter, he refused. So on April 12th, uh, 1861, the Confederates fired shots on Fort Sumter. So that's the first shots of the war. The war had actually begun at this time. Uh, it would be the next day that Major Robert Anderson evacuated the Union troops. And again, nobody died. But fires being shot gained support in the South and the North to start a war. And Lincoln called up 75,000 volunteer soldiers. And because of this, the other states that had not joined the Union yet, which includes Arkansas, Tennessee, North, Sarah, North Carolina, and Virginia, they will join the, the Union. Now, if you notice here, uh, Virginia is a lot bigger than the modern day map. Well, at the beginning, they, that, that's, this is what Virginia looked like. But in 1863, West Virginia would actually separate from Virginia and support the North. Now, in the North, uh, it's all these states in blue, but you see these light blue states? We call these the border states. 
These are slave states that did not succeed from the Union. So it includes Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri. And then in 1863, West Virginia, when they broke away from Virginia. Now, there wasn't as many slaves in these states, and there was more opposition to slavery by, by some of the people living there. But uh, these uh, were very important states for the, for the North because they, well, obviously they can get a, a stronger foothold into the South. Um, but Maryland was actually the most important because that, it surrounds Washington, D.C., and it was uh, Abraham Lincoln who made sure he got Maryland, uh, so he he would not let them succeed, because uh, he could not afford them. Because if if the South had taken over Maryland, they would have taken over Washington D.C. So you're going to need a plan. The North and the South are both going to need some plans on how to fight this war. So the first one is called the Anaconda Plan. This is for the Union. Now remember, the Union is the North. Uh, here in the picture, they call it Scott's Great Snake. And the anaconda is that, that, that snake, right? It's that uh, venomous snake. And the idea is to surround the south, surround the, the, the ports all the way in the, you know, in the Atlantic Ocean and the, um, all the way to the Mississippi River. So they want to control the Mississippi River. They wanted to stop supplies from coming in and supplies from, to going out, right? So they didn't want supplies from the west going in so they could build their navy and their army and and even feed their people. And they didn't want supplies going out, for example, cotton. They didn't want cotton to go to, to Europe, uh, specifically um, Britain, because that would hurt their economy. And possibly a European country could support them, so they're going to try to avoid that. And the Confederacy has a plan too, and their plan was, one, to get help from a European countries like Britain. This, this is called... Uh, well, they, again, they're, they're, Britain was buying a lot of cotton from the South. It was helping their economy. And the Confederacy thought that if they could uh, get Britain to help them, they would continue to be business partners. And, um, you know, that it would be kind of like in the American Revolution when the French helped the colonists. If it wasn't for the French, there would not be the United States of America. And it's the same thing here. If they could get the Europeans or Britain to help them, they... The Southerners, uh, the Confederates, could have won. Now, w- w- I'm going to give you a spoiler alert. No European nation is going to help the South. There's for a few reasons. For example, in Britain, they have uh, they can get cotton from other places like India and Egypt. And number two, there is a growing discontent or uh, 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 dislike in Europe and Britain for, for slavery. So for those two reasons, Britain is never going to help the South. The other objective is they're going to try to prolong the war. So they want the war to go longer and get the North tired and get the Northern people. Because there's some people in the North that support the South and some people just don't want war. They think if it can go for a long time and tire out the North and they spend a lot of money and a lot of people in the North um, are against the war, that eventually the North will just say, okay, forget it, let's have peace. And if they have peace, then you have two countries, the United States of America and the Confederate States of America. Now, for the strengths and weaknesses, now the Union is a much larger population. So the Union population was about 18.5 million, and in the border states, population was 5.5 million. Uh, the Confederacy population was 5.5 million freed people and 3.5 to 4 million enslaved people. The North also had industry, which included factories, firearms, railroad equipment, f- firearms for the second time, <laughs> warships, iron and coal mines, and uh, what else would I say? Yeah, and, and so basically the industry is, gonna, is going to help, is going to help the North. The North also had a navy, and that would help with the Anaconda Plan. So they had, they could do blockades, they could, they could blockade the major ports, they could take control of the Mississippi, and the South did not. So the South, they had to create a, a navy from scratch. Now, the Confederacy had very good leaders. So there's the famous Robert E. Lee and Thomas Stonewall Jackson. We'll talk more about them in this presentation. And the North had some weak ones like George McClellan, but they also had some strong ones like Ulysses S. Grant, who would later become president. 
and the South had confidence and passion, so that, that, that's helpful. <laughs> So this is going to be the first modern war. You're going to have the telegraph. So Lincoln was the first president who could actually communicate on the spot with officers in the field. Now the telegraph was available in the Mexican-American War, which had happened not long before, just over 10 years before. But the president wasn't talking to the field officers at that time, so it wasn't as convenient as it is in the American Civil War. There's also photography. This was, it was the first war to be documented with a camera. And the photographic process at that time was very complicated, so there was no action snapshots. But you could find lots of photographs of the scene after the war or, or of the soldiers. The railroads, so more troops and supplies could be moved. Uh, it helped uh, the, the Union more than Confederacy. The, the Confederate, you know, is more agricultural, agrarian, but... They did have some railroads in the south as well. There were improved rifles so they could shoot further and more accurately. There was also improved bullets where they would put little rivets in the bullet and the, it could shoot straight other than the little little bullet balls which, which didn't fit in the barrel of the rifle as well so it was a little more difficult to make it accurate. But now during the American Revolution they could shoot more accurately. And then of course there was the ironclad ships which was actually first created by the French in 1859, but first used by, uh, in the American Civil War. And that's the picture you see here. These are ironclads that could fight in the ocean or in the Mississippi River. So there was a something, uh, something during the American Civil War that was called contraband camps. So the Union decided they would not return escaped slaves. So before the Civil War, Really, ever since the beginning of the United States in 1776, there were different um, fugitive slave acts. Some were more strict than others. But it was the idea if a slave ran from the South to the North, it was the North's obligation to turn them into the South. But during the war, they're going to stop doing that. And uh, some freed blacks or even runaway, black, runaway blacks, uh, they were used as laborers to support the Union. And later, they would fight. And for their labor, they, were, they earned wages. And many of them set up camps that were near the Union forces. And in these camps, the army provided them with an education. So life in contraband camps was difficult, but provided a road to freedom. So it gave a lot of runaway blacks hope. And in 1863, uh, many of the, the, the blacks from the contraband camps or other places were enlisted into the United States Colored Troops. Uh, escaped slaves uh, were very helpful because they knew the terrain in the South and they fought very well. Now, in the North, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there was support for the war, but there were some people in the North that didn't want the war, right? So it was kind of split for the Democrats, right? So the Republicans were were against slavery and and even at the beginning of the war, it was a war of union. It wasn't a war of emancipation. Uh, but for the Democrats in the North, there were two kinds. There were the war Democrats. They stood behind Lincoln. So they were against slavery. They wanted to keep the union together. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they all were against slavery, but some. And then there's the peace Democrats, and they're called Copperheads. And the, the Copperheads, um, the, the, this, this was a snake. And this was, uh, um, they basically, they, they went against Lincoln. They tried to get, uh, they were sympathetic to the Confederacy. And they exploited the anti-war sentiment. And they wanted Lincoln to, to have peace. He wanted them to, to stop the war. Now, military life was extremely difficult. So for, for much of the war, is relative monotony. It was mixed with brief periods of horror. Uh, many of the soldiers for the North and South, they did daily routines of drills and marching, cleaning weapons and inspections and stuff like that. They wrote letters home. They read newspapers about battles or politics or European affairs. Uh, they often drank and smoked and swore. Sometimes they illegally traded with the enemy, uh, newspapers and uh, tobacco and whatnot. And there was a disease and amputation, which was rampant. 
uh, diseases. Uh, it, you know, they didn't understand germ theory, and uh, they didn't understand the need to replace lost fluids like people today know. And some of the diseases included tuberculosis, measles, uh, rheumatism, typhoid, malaria, dysentery, dysentery, if I pronounce that correctly, smallpox, and there was amputations. And it gave, uh, and this often gave soldiers the best chance to survive, because uh, if if they got shot in the arm, it could it could kill them. Um, and they did have some unsafe practices, and I think many people think that there was no anesthesia. To, to take away the pain from getting your arm or your leg cut off, but that's not true. There was nitrous, nit- nitrous oxide and chloroform and opium and different things to, to ease the pain. Now, if you look at the map, it shows where all the battles during the Civil War took place. Now, notice how there were Western and Eastern uh, theaters in the war. And also notice how most of the war was fought in the south. So you see a lot in Virginia. That kind of looks a little more in the center or north, but that's part of the Confederacy. Uh, the south wanted to bring the war to the north, but they, were, they would be unsuccessful. Two of the biggest and most consequential battles of the nor- that were brought to the north were the Battle of Antietam and the Battle of Gettysburg. But, they, but the Confederacy, Confederacy wasn't able to get a strong foothold into the north. So let's talk about the war, the war for a union. So the American Civil War lasted from 1861 to 1865, but the beginning of the war was more about union for the North, at least. That will change into emancipation as the war moves on. Now the first battle is called the Battle of Bull Run or the Battle of Manassas. Now you'll notice that some of the major, not all the battles, but some of the major battles in the Civil War have two names so the north battles were was named in sorry they were they have two names because there's a a a name from the union and a name from the south they have they call it differently the north named it after geographic geography geographic locations so like bull run was a, a small creek in the area and manassas was a local um a local junction or a local city nearby so the south named it after cities or towns but this is the first major battle, and the Union thought the war would be really quick, and they would be wrong. <laughs> so the Union soldiers, uh, under a, a general named General McDowell, marched from Washington, D.C. to Virginia. They're trying to go to the Confederate capital of Richmond. So it's about 30, 40 miles to get there, and it was a nice day. And again, at this time, people didn't know how bloody and how long this war would be. So some civilians actually walked with the troops and they brought picnics and food to eat so they could watch the battle. When the Union soldiers reached Bull Creek, sorry, Bull Run Creek, they were confronted by Confederate soldiers. The first part of the battle was chaotic. The Union was winning and pushing the Confederates back, but then Confederate reinforcements arrived by train. Among the reinforcements included Thomas Jackson, better known as Thomas Stonewall Jackson, and his Virginia Brigade. Stonewall Jackson, he helped the Confederacy win this battle, and this is going to provide him fame. Uh, See, the reinforcements stopped the Union advancement, and Confederate General Barnard B., another Confederate general, he looked up and he saw Stonewall Jackson, and he said, look over there, Jackson's standing there like a stone wall, and he will forever have this name. In fact, before this battle, Stonewall Jackson was unknown. You know, he went to West Point, he was a teacher in Virginia for a military academy, His students didn't like him, but he's a very strict and disciplined uh, leader. And because of, he'll be one of the great leaders for the South, and he will die, unfortunately, during the the Civil War. So the Union was pushed back, and soldiers and civilians ran back to Washington, D.C. It was chaotic on the way back as well. So the Battle of Bull Run was an embarrassment for the Union. But the important thing about this battle is, number one, of course, it's a Confederate victory, but number two... The war is going to be long, so no short war, which they were hoping for before that, before this battle. Now, 
this was early on in the war, and there's going to be some more small engagements, but there's not going to be a major battle for almost a year, just small little engagements here and there. And during this time, the federal government is going to expand the scope of government. So what are they going to do? Now, one, be clear, there's no Southerners to to stall any um, proposals or proposals or bills in Congress. So there's kind of unanimity, kind of they could, it was no problem for the, for the North to pass bills. Now the first thing is the Homestead Act. That was signed by Lincoln uh, in 1862. It granted Americans 160 acre plots of land for a small filing fee. Uh, this led to Western expansion and allowed citizens to become landowners, and it was available to freed slaves. Now the second thing is the Land Grant College, which is also known as the Morrill Act. This set aside federal lands to create colleges to improve agriculture and mechanical arts and would later expand to other disciplines from the, from the colleges. Now, some colleges today that benefited from the Morrill Act include the University of Wisconsin, Iowa State University, Rutgers University, and more. During this time, there was also the national, a national controlled currency. So before the Civil War, money was printed by banks and back, backed by gold and silver. Lincoln needed money, and he didn't want to go into great debt by borrowing it from other countries. So the Secretary of Treasury, his name was Salmon Chase, suggested issuing an American currency, which would become known as the greenbacks, which looks familiar to the greenbacks, the green money we use today. <laughs> the greenbacks were not backed by gold or silver. At this time, uh, the administration also created uh, banks with national characteristics. So this is not like a national bank, like the first bank of the United States or the second bank of the United States or the Federal Reserve, uh, which will come later. The first and second national banks were were not rechartered. They were stopped. And this one is not exactly like a federal bank, but it has some of the characteristics. So they passed what is called the National Banking Acts of 1863 and 64, where there are two which were two federal acts that established a system of national banks, uh, small national banks, and created the United States national banking system. So it's a little bit different from the first and second national bank. War would continue, of course, and uh, the, the next portion I would like to talk about is the Peninsular Campaign. So after a year of small engagements, the Union started a campaign. It was 120 soldiers from the Army of the Potomac, uh, went into Virginia. So this was another attempt to capture Richmond. Richmond Richmond's going to be a very uh, desirable um, attack uh, city, a city to attack. Now, under General George McClellan, who was very slow and cautious and throughout history, he's, he's not considered a successful general, uh, he overestimated the, the size of the Confederate Army. And the Confederate uh, General Joseph Johnston was wounded during this battle and he was replaced by Robert E. Lee. And Robert E. Lee turned the remaining battles in, the compa- into the, in this campaign into a humiliating defeat for the Union. So this is another tremendous failure for the Union. So what we've talked about thus far with the major battles, Bull Run and the, this Peninsular Campaign, were, were two big disasters for, for the Union in the East. And also now Robert E. Lee is on the scene. And Robert E. Lee has gone down in history as a great general and very controversial because he was the, one of the top generals for, um, for the South. Uh, but it should be noted that Robert, not Robert E. Lee, sorry, um, Abraham Lincoln asked Robert E. Lee to be the general of the Union. Uh, he was a great general during the Mexican-American War. But Robert E. Lee was, for, for, was from Virginia and he didn't want to fight against his home state. So he fought for the Confederacy. So there's Union failures, as I mentioned, in Bull Run and the Peninsular Campaign, but in western, uh, in the western part of the, the war, in the western theater, it provided hope. Uh, and I also remember the Anaconda Plan. So the Union wanted to block the Confederate part, ports in the Atlantic Ocean along the water in New Orleans and whatnot, and also control the Mississippi. So the western part was very important. And this will be a major battle or a major victory for, for the North. Um, one of the great generals from the South is Ulysses S. Grant, who will be, later become a president. 
But at about the same time as McClellan was losing in the Peninsular Campaign in the East, Union forces attacked two forts. One was Fort Henry and one was Fort Donelson. And it should be mentioned in the East, they were fighting for capitals like Richmond or, well, D.C. There was some fighting got to D.C., but fighting for capitals or major cities. But in the West, it was for rivers. And Union General Ulysses S. Grant captured Fort Henry and Fort Donelson along the Tennessee River, which was very close to the Mississippi, which was a very strategic um, place. The battles took place near the Tennessee-Kentucky border, uh, which is not far from the Mississippi River. Uh, and controlling rivers like the Tennessee River and the Cumberland River, which was also in that area, would allow the Union to get a solid foothold into the South and slowly invade, which they will do later. It would bring the Union closer to controlling the Mississippi as well. At Fort McHenry, sorry, at Fort Henry, Union ironclad ships, uh, warships, destroyed Confederate shipping and railroad bridges along the river. The victory at Fort Henry would allow the Union troops to move on and capture Fort Donaldson, which wasn't very far away. And uh, they would capture that as well. So these two victories uh, gave control of the Cumberland River, which was just north of the Tennessee River, and provided the North with an avenue to invade the South. In addition to providing an avenue to invading the South, it helped the Anaconda Plan. From this point onward, Union was able to block imports, including food, um, people in the South, soldiers and citizens didn't get enough food and would almost starve later and this was a major union victory so there's some some defeats in the in the east but then there's there's some major victories in the west another major victory in the west is the battle of shiloh and which would help the union capture new orleans so from fort henry which had just been captured ulysses s grant you can look at the map here too if you look at the maps i'm putting little little dots or little stars or battle where, where the battles are taking place. Uh, but after capturing Fort McHenry, Ulysses S. Grant moved south down the Tennessee River. And then they had a two-day battle, which was the deadliest to that point in Shiloh. It was a major Union victory. So Union would, would like I said, move on to New, sorry, New Orleans, which is a very strategic location. And it would finish 1862 successfully for the Union. But it was a deep blow for for the Confederacy. Now, I'd like to also talk about something called the Confiscation Acts. So there's numerous confiscation, confiscation acts between 1861 and 1862. It was passed by Congress and it was signed by Lincoln. Lincoln hesitantly signed the bill. He was worried that he would lose the border states. They would leave the Union and fight for the Confederacy. In fact, that's probably why Lincoln did not abolish slavery in the border states from the very beginning, because he needed their support for the war. But this authorized the confiscation of any Confederate slaves. Confederate officials in areas occupied by a Union army who did not surrender within 60 days of the act's passing would have their slaves freed. So these acts also encourage more slaves to run away. And word of the confiscation acts spread rapidly in the South. This emboldened slaves to run. This was also one step closer to the Emancipation Proclamation, which would free slaves in the South. Some of Lincoln's advisors suggested Lincoln not to free the slaves in the South, to wait until the war was over and to, 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 to not do it too early. Um... And, and another reason I've already mentioned it is if he did emancipate all the slaves, not just in the border states, but in the South, then maybe some of the border states would also um, change their allegiance to the Confederacy. But this was one step closer to emancipation. Now, um, let's go back to the East. Again, look at the map. You can see a little, little battle flash. Uh, most of the fighting has been in the red. And there, of course, if you look at the map earlier in this presentation, you'll see it was many different places, but I'm talking about some of the major battles. And there was this attempt to bring the war to the north. So uh, the Union called the Battle of Antietam. They called this the Battle of Antietam. And the South would call this the Battle of Sharpsburg. And the Confederate President Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee, one of the, the top generals, 
wanted to bring the war to the north and win European diplomatic recognition. So they thought if they, it's, again, I'm going to compare it to the American Revolution, when the colonists won Saratoga, that convinced the French, with Benjamin Franklin's urging to help the Americans and be a turning point in the war. The South is kind of doing the same thing. If they could win some major battles or bring the war to the North, they would also get diplomatic uh, recognition from European countries, and they would be officially a country, and possibly support, uh, military support. But there's also they also want to make the, the North and the Copperheads or whoever <laughs> dissatisfied with the war and encourage Lincoln to, to stop the war. Now, this is going to be the bloodiest one-day battle in the war. There's going to be 22,000 casualties. It was indecisive. Union had many more, not many more, but they had more casualties, but South were forced back to Virginia. So this attempt to bring the war to the North was a failure. Before the battle, actually, the North discovered Confederate battle plans. They were, they were wrapped around a cigar. cigar. So this helped McClellan actually win this battle. So McClellan was the, 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 the kind of weak, slow leader from the Peninsula campaign. And he's going to make a mistake here too because after Lee retreats, he could have followed Lee, but he didn't. So this was a big, uh, big mistake by McClellan. And Lincoln was very furious at the Union general, and he relieved him of his position. And... Uh, but, but the important thing about here, and this is the thing to remember, if you can remember one thing about the Battle of Antietam, is, well, number one, it was bringing the war to the north. Number two, there's lots of casualties. But number three, this is going to lead Lincoln to passing the Emancipation Proclamation. So uh, this is a very important part of the war and a big issue that was going on in the United States ever since 1776. So on January 1st, 1863... Uh, the Battle of Antietam had prompted Lincoln to release the Emancipation Proclamation. He had already actually written it before, but it encouraged him to release it. Uh, he didn't release it earlier because he didn't want to make the border states upset. Uh, he also didn't want to do anything unconstitutional. He was a constitutionalist, so he's trying to f follow what was right or what was legal underneath the Constitution. Um, but the Emancipation Proclamation freed slaves in the Confederate States of America. But it's more of a war tactic. It's not like the 13th Amendment where uh, an attempt for moral reasons to stop the institution of slavery because Lincoln actually only freed the slaves in the Confederate States. The border states, slavery was still illegal. So imagine that. By this time in 1863, the very first day of 1863, Slavery is illegal in the South, but some of the border states, not all the states in the North, but some of the states in the North, slavery was still legal. So slavery would officially become illegal after the war in the North, but at this time it's only the South. And it's, again, this is, a, this is a war tactic. It's to get some of the slaves to run away to the North and help the North and eventually fight for the North, but also hurt the Southern economy. And by this time in the war, the, the South is hurting because most of the fighting is in the South, there are, the Anaconda plan isn't 100% successful right now, but um, a lot of, you know, food is not coming in and people are getting hungry and they can't export their cotton. And now the slaves uh, are freed. So their whole economic system is, has been destroyed. So we can call this the war of emancipation. So of course, this is all the same war, but now it's more not just about saving the Union, it's also about emancipating uh, slaves. So we have another battle. And this is the Battle of Chance Chancellorsville. Now this is also in Virginia. So most of these battles are in Virginia. These are the major battles. And that's right on the border between the North and the South. It's right near Richmond, the capital of the South, and right near D.C., the capital of the North. And this was Robert E. Lee's perfect battle, maybe his last great battle. But a smaller Confederate army defeated a much larger Union army. And Stonewall Jackson was there, and actually he would die in this battle. He was hit by friendly fire, and his arm would have to be amputated. And from like pneumonia, he would die eight days later from, from his injuries. 
And this was Lee's right hand man. So this was a great general for the South that w- would die. And this is going to hurt the South. But with confidence after the victory, and this was that perfect battle, Robert E. Lee has the confidence and the motivation to bring the war back to the North. And that's what he's going to do. He's going to go towards Gettysburg. Now, looking back on it, he should have not went to Gettysburg. He should have went a little more to the east, to the Washington, D.C., if they wanted to win the war. But it's easy to make those points after the war is done. But he's going to take the war to the north. He's going to go towards Gettysburg. Now, while he's going up to Gettysburg, over a long period of time, actually, there, May 18th to July 4th, you can look at the map on the top right, uh, there's what is called the Seeds of Vicksburg, and this is Ulysses, Ulysses, sorry, Ulysses S. Grant. And he launched this campaign, he surrounded them. Uh, and this is a strategic place because if they win, if they can take Vicksburg, they can take the, the whole Mississippi River, right? They already had the Fort Henry and the Fort Donaldson, uh, New Orleans, but Vicksburg, this would finish off, finish it off and finish off the, the Anaconda, Anaconda plan. And then the, the Union could just move in and go to Atlanta and take some major cities. He would take Vicksburg, and the Anaconda plan would be uh, a success, and the Confederacy was cut in half, so everything to the west of Mississippi could not get in to the, to the Confederate States of America uh, from the Mississippi River east, and no supplies and, and food and all that could not get in. And in fact, it's Lincoln who felt that this victory of Vicksburg was the key, Right? And the other key would be Gettysburg, which is happening at about the same time, which is only a three-day battle, actually. The siege was months. But this is a three-day battle, and, and Lee wanted wanted him to come, wanted uh, uh, Grant to follow him all the way up to, to Pennsylvania, but he doesn't. And this is, of course, the most famous battle. Uh, you know, there's, there's going to be it's a three-day battle, sorry, and there's going to be 51,000 people who die. And again, um, the, it's, it's another attempt to bring the war to the to the north. It's really his last chance, right? Chancellorsville was a great victory, and this is it could have been all different if if the Confederates win. So obviously the the Union wins this battle, but so fifty one thousand people die. The, on the third day, there's something that's called Pickett's Charge, and this would end the battle. And there's about it's an open field about a mile long, Confederates one after another. Twelve thousand it was like more than twelve thousand men and nine lines charged in an open field, and they were just slaughtered. And then Lee had to retreat back to Virginia. And that would end the Battle of Gettysburg, and that would really be the last chance for for the Confederates, especially with, with um, Ulysses S. Grant taking the Mississippi River. And this was kind of uh, Lee's worst mistake. And of course, maybe you know something about the Gettysburg Address, uh, you know, it'd be four months later that uh, th- th- that um, Lincoln would go to Gettysburg to commemorate it. And here's the famous speech. And uh, w- something about this speech, too, is it should be, should be mentioned. Um, you know, this is four months after the battle, and he traveled by train to Gettysburg, and he was sick, and he wasn't feeling very good, actually. And the first speaker was a guy named Edward Everett, and he spoke for two hours. And then Lincoln spoke for three minutes. It became one of the most or the most famous speech in American history. And it's so small I can fit it on one slide. So four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we're engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who were who here gave their lives that that nation might live. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. 
It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Now, this speech is interesting in, in numerous ways. Not only is it the most famous and elegant speech in American history, um, you know, now that the war is about emancipation, and some historians and some people will disagree with this, but um, it is argued that this, you know, the Constitution, the idea of liberty and the idea of the United States was great, but the United States hadn't lived up to it. But this was a new chance to actually live up to what the ideals of the Constitution um, promised. And of course, after the Civil War, there's going to be lots of racial injustice for another hundred years and even longer. But it was a start. And uh, this this is kind of another a rebirth of what the Constitution uh, promised. Um, and also it should be mentioned too here, or not mentioned, just something I find interesting. If you notice the line that says, The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. So the world will little note nor long remember what we say here. Well, this is the most famous speech in American history, so that is not true. They will. Now, at about this time, there's some riots. Uh, some people in the North didn't like the war. Uh, but the Union passed the Enrollment Act. And it was a, a military draft to get more fighters for the war. But it wasn't all that fair because the wealthy could pay $300 to get substitutes for them to be drafted. And there was also some discontent. So, for example, the Emancipation Proclamation made some immigrants feel that freed slaves would take their jobs. So white rioters killed 120 citizens in the New York riots and 11 blacks were lynched. Property was destroyed, and the riots were finally stopped by soldiers who were returning from Gettysburg, right? And I should also mention that the South also had a draft, too, and they, their draft went up to people who were as old as 50 because they, need, they needed more fight, fighters for the war. Now, in 1864, uh, Lincoln is going to win. So after taking Vicksburg and, and, and stopping Robert Lee from taking Gettysburg and moving up north, um... Ulysses S. Grant and another great leader for, for the North, William Tecumseh Sherman, are going to move into the South. And Sherman, William Tecumseh Sherman, is going to get take Atlanta. And when he takes Atlanta, that's going to change the mood of the war. And Lincoln's going to win in 1864. And it should be mentioned that his competitor was McClellan. And McClellan was that leader that he was furious at because he was too weak and too slow and he didn't stop Lee when he could have earlier. What's interesting about this, though, is the war is going to continue for another year. And if McClellan won, McClellan uh, campaigned on ending the war. If McClellan won, there would be two countries right now. At that time, and who knows how long they would exist. Who knows what would happen if that was the case. Um, something interesting about this, too, if you see here the, the, the inauguration at the Capitol... Supposedly, I don't know if this is 100% fact, but the story goes that in that crowd above Lincoln, I don't know if you see Lincoln in the middle there, kind of on the balcony up there somewhere, is a guy named John Wilkes Booth, a famous actor. Now there's going to be some more fighting, and the North is want, wants to take the Union, or sorry, wants to take Richmond, and uh, the, the military strategy at this time changed. So Lincoln promoted U Ulysses S. Grant. He became the great leader of the South. And it, it went from a limited war to a total war. So the last few, to, few couple of years, the last year, was total destruction in the South. Uh, Grant was willing to continually attack to get the war won and over with. Now remember, they controlled the Mississippi. So they just had to move in and attack and cut off the supplies going to the South. 
And this would result in some of the bloodiest battles which happened in the East. And there's going to be another attempt at getting Richmond. And during the Richmond-Petersburg campaign, which is in Virginia, William Tecumseh Sherman, and at this time, I should say, William Tecumseh Sherman is moving towards Atlanta, and Grant is up near Richmond. Um, Grant is able to surround Petersburg, which is going to cut off the supplies to Richmond. So it's going to, it's going to suffocate and starve uh, Richmond. So this is a huge, this is this pretty much ends the war, plus the march to the sea, which I'll talk about next. But he basically takes Richmond by cutting off all the supplies. And this is trench, trench warfare. And this is kind of be a foreshadow to World War One, which will happen, uh, you know, less than 100 years later. Uh, but Robert Lee, he, he, he had to give up Petersburg and Richmond. And his, by this time, the, the troops are starving. They, they don't have enough food or supplies, and they, they, they have no strength. Uh, so this is going to be, basically the war is over now. It's not quite over, there's going to be a little bit more. Uh, for example, the march to the sea. So while this is happening, while he's taking Richmond and, and, uh, and uh, Petersburg, uh, Grant is, William Tecumseh Sherman is making his way down to Atlanta. And when he took Atlanta, so this is all about the same time as, elect- as Lincoln is getting elected. He takes Atlanta, and that will help Lincoln win the election. But from Atlanta, he's going to go to Sh- Savannah. And, uh, uh, you know, he basically burned Atlanta and, and destroyed it. And he's going to destroy everything from Atlanta to Savannah, like a torched earth policy. Um, so, let's see. Uh, Yep, exactly. So and, and, and he's just gonna he's gonna march. So the the railroads, he's gonna he's gonna just destroy that. He's gonna heat them up and bend them around trees. They're called Sherman ties or bow ties or something like that. And just destroy little villages and everything along the way. So this was to 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 put a final touch to end this horrible war. And he's gonna get to Savannah, and he's gonna take that. And he's going to say, he's going to write a telegram to Abraham Lincoln in D.C. He's, and he writes a telegram that says, I beg to present you as a Christmas gift, the city of Savannah, with 150 heavy guns and plenty of ammunition and about 25,000 bales of cotton. So that will end the war. So Lee, after being in Richmond, he's going to move down with his troops who are all starving. And he's going to try to meet up with some other Confederates uh, in North Carolina area. But he, in Virginia, he would be cut off by Union forces near the Appomattox Courthouse. So by this point, the soldiers are starving, and he's surrounded. He's cut off. Uh, so Lee would surrender. And when Ulysses, in, in the courthouse, when Ulysses S. Grant and Robert, Lee, Robert E. Lee met, Lee was dressed in his white, beautiful, impeccably perfect, clean suit. And in comes Ulysses S. Grant, who's wearing, who's got dirt on his boots, and, he's, and he looks a little more ragged. And they kind of they kind of talk, and they talk about their memories of each other during the Mexican-American War. And Lee, they shake hands, and, and Lee kind of um, surrenders graciously. So this kind of helps the Union survive. Uh, he was very gracious when, 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 he, when he surrendered. And the North, uh, they were gracious to the South, too. They allowed uh, Lee's troops to, to take their horses and their weapons. And he also helped them uh, get some food. So this was, a, this was a, a good ending to a terrible war. And unfortunately, uh, just about five days after the surrender, that actor, John Wilkes Booth, who was at the 1864 inauguration of of um, Abraham Lincoln who had a plan, a conspiracy to with others to kill Abraham Lincoln, the Secretary of State, and the Vice President. Uh, the only one that was successful was John Wilkes Booth who killed Abraham Lincoln. And that would be the end of the war. I mean, the, the, that not, the, not the assassination of Lincoln. It was already over at that time. But... There is going to be a reconstruction period, and it's going to be a disaster. And if Lincoln survived, it might have been a lot different. And not long after that, there's going to be the 13th Amendment. So this is about nine months after the Appomattox Courthouse surrender by Lee. The 13th Amendment was ratified, 
slavery was finally abolished. So that is it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this this presentation. I hope you learned something. If uh, you found anything that was incorrect or if you have any comments, please write them below. And I really appreciate you making it this far into the video. And if you have made it this far, you got to give me that thumbs up and you have to give me that uh, sign, press that subscription button. And please check out my store again. So thank you so much. Take care.